What's up, everybody? Um, it's been a while since I've given an update, so I just wanted to talk about what's going on a little bit. Uh, I've obviously been stuck at home more than usual because of all the you know coronavirus craziness that's going on, but uh, I sincerely hope that you and your families are doing well through this time. It's, it's pretty crazy for everybody. I know everybody's affected in their own individual ways, so um, sending good vibes your way if, if you've been affected. Um, now that we've got the virtue signaling out of the way, um, and you think that I'm a nice guy, please go ahead and smash, smash, smash that like button. Thank you. Yeah. Now, let me tell you why I'm really here. Uh, I've been quietly working on a new business uh, venture and I've been recording the whole process. Um, my plan is to create not only a successful business, but also a video series to inspire other entrepreneurs to show them really how easy it is to go from step zero to step one. Uh, you know, that there's so many knowledge gaps that it's okay to admit that you that you have and how it's how it's so easy to get the resources and the information that you need online or to get in touch with the professionals that you need. I really just want to enable other people to be able to monetize their passions. Um, being able to do what you love every single day, there's nothing better to that. Um, the truth is most people are going to work from 18 years old to uh, 65, 70 years old and you're going to retire and you're not going to have uh, a great quality of life. That's just kind of the truth. Um, so if you can do what you want to do every day until you're 70 years old, that's a, that's a, that's a huge win. So the way that the series is going to go, it's going to be more of like a reality format. It's not going to be something with high production value. It's not going to have Lamborghinis, Bugatti Bayrons, hot babes in bikinis, piles of cash, promise to get rich quick. It's, it's not going to be any of that. Um, but you know the type I'm talking about, right? Here in my garage, just bought this uh, new Lamborghini here. You know, I'm helping thousands of my students all over the world live the exact lifestyle I'm living thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands, literally spending crazy money on LV, Gucci, standing in some of the top hotels all through my laptop right there. But wait, there's more. Six million dollar mansion, $10,000 Rolex, $100,000 on the table, $100 million view, five-star hotel, $100 supercar, $100,000 in watches, and $50 million phone and laptop. Yep. Nope. There are way too many of those out there. There's... Business videos get a bad rep in general. I think they prey on too many um, people who are really just trying to be able to create a better life for themselves. Um, so when you've got this guy with all the cash and the money and the cars and the babes and everything that you could possibly want, right, then how is it that you just got to follow what that guy's doing, right? Nope. I promise my series is not going to tell you how to get rich quick. It's not going to be a multi-level pyramid scheme. It's not going to be any of that. Like, really, it's showing how you can take just a simple idea that you have that starts from a, a passion-driven approach where you have a little bit of knowledge in the space, and how can you build that and, and create a business out of it that allows you to do that. So what will my content focus on? It's going to be about the real challenges of starting a business, especially when you're broke. It's called bootstrapping. You start with very, very little money. Um, in this case, we're starting with $3,000. So um, how can you build a business out of three grand? Most people would say you can't. I will show you that you can. Other things that we're going to focus on are uh, the real challenges of starting and scaling a business, going from step zero to step one, um, the mindset, the strategies, behaviors, things that it takes to really stay on top of everything. My goal is to instill a confidence in every single person that they can monetize their passions, that they can start a business if they want to, that they can get out of that nine to five job that they hate, um, that if they've been stuck in a career for 20 years, it's not too late to do something. Um, I, I mean, if I can do it, anybody can. That's the truth. Again, I'm, you'll see. This is the most bare bones budget production. You're going to see me do it from ground zero. And if I can do it, honestly, anybody can. Um, the first video is really just a teaser of what's to come. Uh, it's going to feature our first guest. He is a very distinguished and successful entrepreneur named Felix Ashu. Felix has earned a bachelor in accounting and economics, uh, a master of business administration. He has his MBA, a, a doctorate of law, a uh, master of arts and finance from Harvard, uh, and he's currently going for his PhD in finance. So Felix is really well-rounded from an education standpoint, and he's an even better dude. You'll see. Uh, Felix and I do share a fundamental goal, which is to inspire as many entrepreneurs to start their businesses so that they can provide value for others. Um, so really what you'll see that this, the entire interview with Felix is uncut. So you'll see from the moment that I, I picked him out of the list of people that I wanted to hire, sending the messages to get the meeting set up, going into the meeting, introduction, everything that we learned. Um, I'm not going to cut any of it out. You're going to see the real deal. So.
the topic of the episode is going to be two things. Um, one, how easy it is to actually get the professional talents that you need, whether that be a lawyer, an accountant, um, somebody to draw up your legal papers. It doesn't matter what it is. The other thing we'll be talking about in this episode is different business structures. So whether you want to set yourself up as an LLC, a S corp, a C corp, what does that mean from a tax perspective, from a liability perspective? Um, do you want to set up your company in Delaware? Do you want to set it up in your home state? There's a lot of different things that come into play. It can be really confusing, but Felix does a really good job of breaking it down. So at this point, I'm just going to stop talking and play the video. I hope you enjoy. Five minutes later. Actually, I, I don't really need to post. Like, I, I'm sure there's just like, um, I just need somebody for accountant consulting. Ooh, not cheap. What's up, Felix? This guy looks dope. He's earned at least 10 bucks. Oh, man. Yeah, this dude's educated as f All right, actually, I'm just going to post a job. See if I can get somebody in, like... I don't mean, like... I, I want to give people what they feel like their time is worth. Um, but I think right now it makes sense for me to just make a post to say, yo, we just need like maybe uh, 30 minutes of consultation and that's about it. Like we don't even need an hour's worth of work. Um, you know, I guess probably most people aren't going to do that for less than 50 bucks. So if it's just 50 bucks an hour, either way, I'm just going to post say, uh, well, no, I would rather vet like this. Let's see. You want 65 an hour. Yo, you know, I'm all about giving people a chance. So this dude doesn't have any jobs. I'm going to, I want to give him a job. Let's see. Dude, yeah. Platform pro contract title. He wants 65 an hour. Okay. Why don't we give him? We'll give him 40 bucks for 30 minutes of his time. That's paying him. 80 bucks an hour. A little bit more than he wants, but I generally wouldn't want to do anything that's less than a couple hours worth of work, you know? Like, to really get your hands dirty, meet somebody, and have to probe and understand everything. Like, 30 minutes usually just isn't enough, and I, I, so I wouldn't fuck with it. If this guy wants to, I want to give him a little bit more. Dude, this is such a good song, too. One minute, 37 seconds later. I'm gonna call Michael quick and see if he wants to meet um, with this dude tomorrow and see what time works for him. Otherwise, I'm just gonna meet with him. I don't like, he doesn't have to. What's up, brother? 
Cool, cool. Just a real quick question for you. I had just posted um, an ad on Upwork, or like an offer request to this guy for 30 minutes of consultation. He's an accountant, just to make sure that we get the structure right of the business in terms of like LLC or S Corp and what um, what state to do it in and everything. You don't have to go to the meeting if you don't want to. I just wanted to offer you the opportunity um, to sit in for 30 minutes with the accountant dude. So he said anytime tomorrow. I was thinking like, um, six, uh, either 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. my time would be like five and six years. Okay, perfect. Of course, man. All right, I'll talk to you later. Have a good day, man. Bye. All right, just like that, guys. That's how easy it is. Like, you got questions, they're like, oh man, I'll never be able to figure out all this complicated stuff. Like, literally, all I had to do was get on the phone, like, get on Upwork. It took me all of signing into my Gmail account, going and searching accountant, picking somebody from the list, sending them a short message saying, hey, I just need to meet with you for 30 minutes. I've got some questions. Can you meet? He responded in one minute, guys. One minute. And we have a meeting tomorrow. And it's, that's it. We're, we're rolling. Done. Feels good. All right. Uh, it's 7.15. We're about to meet with Felix. Let's go. Woo. Hey. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Yeah. How are you? you have hey. Care and everything. How are you? Yeah, Felix, nice to meet you, man. I'm stoked that we were able to meet so quick. Oh, yes. Uh, even though I have a big firm, I try as much as possible, you know, to, like, respond immediately to, like, all my Yeah, you want to get it done right away. I, I can respect that. I appreciate that. Dude, your place looks nice. That's cool. Thanks, thanks. Yes, thanks. Uh, we, we have to, like, reimagining working from home, but... Uh, I started going to the office anyway, so yeah. Yeah, cool, man. Where are you at right now? I'm in Dallas. I'm in, in Dallas. Awesome, cool, cool. Yeah, I Denver or Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, my parents actually just moved back from Dallas, so I got to go visit them quite a few times. It's a it's a great city, man. I've had some good times down there. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you guys are doing okay right now. Are you guys having any of the... Yeah, with, with all the frenzies and the crazies going out there, yeah, for the most part. So the, the weekend was crazy, though. But, uh, you know, um, that society, it comes with its issues and all that stuff. So, But I hope at the end of the day, everyone is safe. And, you know, the destruction ceases or whatever it is. But, you know... We need peace. Uh, you know, I don't... <laughs> I yeah, I don't run. I'm not running for office or do politics, but you know that's my own contribution. So tell me, um, you guys uh, want to register your LLC? That's um, got a couple questions on that. Real quick before we get started, I just want to um, ask if it's okay if I record this um, from like a, a bit. Okay, so, awesome, awesome. Um, we're gonna be making a video series. We're trying to build out the business in 30 days, um, and we're gonna make a series just kind of to inspire other entrepreneurs to get started, showing how you can bootstrap a company, how you can use services like Upwork and Free Up to get people real. Qu I mean, like this is gonna be a great piece, man. I'm not gonna lie because the fact that I posted, uh, I sent the hire request specifically to you i picked you out i said i want to give this guy a chance i see he's new to the platform you always want to give the new guy a chance and you responded in one minute so I, like this episode is going to be showing how you can get the legal and professional services that you need in under an hour that's really what happened so um and it's credit to you man i appreciate that and i will um anything that we use you and i will send a um a screen or two first before it gets posted so that you can approve it. I usually don't worry about it, so it's all good. Yeah. Cool, cool. I know we only got 30 minutes here. I respect your time. If we go a little bit over, um, I can always send you a little bit more money, whatever we need to do. Um, you know, I, I want to give you an opportunity you know, I, I to share anything else you want to share about yourself in terms of like your hobbies. Um, I saw your education, dude. I mean, you're well-educated. You went to Harvard, look, working on your PhD. Um, props to you, man. It's, it's fantastic. So... I have no concerns there, but I mean, is there anything else that you wanted to share that you think is like unique or interesting about you? Uh, well, I think the, what is interesting about me, um, I play music, you know, I play the keyboard, you know, sometimes when I'm, I'm free, but I travel a lot. But what keeps me awake at night is 
really um, empowering small businesses, right? So I'm one of those, um, yes, Harvard folks who don't believe in working for large corporations because I'm not 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 not, a, not anything against. And if this goes over thirty minutes, you guys don't pay me. You know, that's it's also what part of what I do. I like talk to small businesses. Um, I think that uh, what powers the backbone of our economy is small businesses. You would hear politicians saying that all the time, right? But at the end of the day, you don't actually see them helping those small businesses. I'm one of those people that really um, advocate for helping small businesses because, and when I say helping small businesses, it's actually from the start. Like, you guys want to start something. How do you even get an LLC? Most people think, oh, I don't have the money to hire a lawyer. I don't have the money to hire a CP. I don't have the money to hire a Harvard graduate. Not necessarily, right? Um, I charge $250 an hour when I'm downtown Dallas on Upwork is $65 an hour. Sometimes I do that for free. Why? Because it's my choosing, right? The only thing that I sell is my brain. And I can decide to give you a discount. I can decide to not give you a discount. So all small businesses have to do is ask, right? Because sometimes you see the fancy lawyer offices and everything. All that is in your head is the fees that you think you're going to pay. Instead of thinking about the business strategy, sometimes they say um, closed mouths don't get fed. All yeah. you really need to do is ask, right? Because once, because the thing with small businesses is once you're able to set up the accounting system, you're able to tell the small business owner, get an LLC, separate it from your person, have a limited liability company, Yes, make sure you don't use your card at the nail shop, at the bar, because those are not business expenses. Pay yeah. yourself a salary. Once you're able to give them, give them that guidance from the start, then they're able to like run their businesses, especially the entrepreneurs, right? Because then they focus more on the operational parts of your business. Now, in my experience, 90% of my clients are clients who are not compliant, right? They've grown their business to about two, $3 million, and they now have an IRS audit because they're commingling funds. Usually, when you want to start a business, it's always your personal funds. And the tendency to use your personal credit card for the business kind of grows as that business grows. Very few business people think about the time to stop and say, okay, let me separate my business from my person and all that stuff, right? So it's like me, particularly. I have a Zoom account for Felix Ashu that is private, and then I have a Zoom account for my company, right? So that whatever I'm doing for the company is different. And if I want to chat with friends anywhere else, you know, I can do that as well. So once you start inculcating those practices for small businesses, then they get to understand. Because a small business without a legal foundation, without an accounting foundation, without a solid financial foundation, um, is just bound to fail or they're bound to spend a lot of money in compliance down the road. You know, the IRS always comes to you five years after you have committed the act. It's cheaper to do it right the first time than it is to pay for the right disaster the in the end, so for sure. That's what keeps me up at night. I'm also, a, I run a small, FA Capital Fund is a small uh, hedge fund family office. So I look at emerging markets, you know, um, mostly a long guy. I'm not like a day trader. But Thoughts on know, crypto? Yes, also on crypto. I have one of my younger brother actually runs the crypto part. I don't really understand the technical terms of the crypto. I just know to buy and hold and wait to see what happens in the future. Um, I, love but then I love it. I read a lot about companies and, you know, what they're doing out there in terms of, you know, social responsibility, you know, in general, just how it's evolving. And that's what's really triggered uh, my educational background because, you know, just doing accounting, wasn't sufficient for me because I understood that, you know, at some point, if you're a CPA, if you think about tax, it's a law, right? So, uh, and then when I started discovering that um, your CP, this relationship you have with your CPA is confidential, whereas the relationship you have with your lawyer is privileged. And at first, you'd be like, okay, what's the difference? Well, there's a difference, right? So one can testify against you, the other cannot. So all of those dynamics, I saw that to, to successfully run an organization, you know, you need to have, not say, you, you need to be able to wear so many hats and help a small business, right? So they come for accounting services, I help them. They come for finance services, I help them. So I got a master's in accounting, a master's in finance, a law degree, and then I got an executive 
to get from MIT. I saw you had the law too, so you're you're right. well rounded in the space, no doubt. Right. And your so, MBA, right? Right, and an MBA as well. Jesus. So I uh, 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 recently licensed uh, uh, as the uh, Texas bar, and, you know. Congratulations, man! Yeah, That's huge. No, yeah, I have no intention of practicing, but you know, now I'm. I think if I uh, want to help a small business, I can give them that kind of advice from every angle, right? Employment law, tax law, raising capital, all that stuff. So it actually helps them. So that's really what I do every day. So once I do that, you know, huge Liverpool fan, huge New England Patriots fan. Go Pats, yep. A soccer in college. Um, uh, originally from Cameroon, been in Dallas for about 15 years. Um, travel a lot. I also have holdings in Switzerland, um, Manchester, and uh, the United Arab Emirates. So most clients there as well. So that's what keeps wow. me up. Yeah, but um, yeah. So not not fun. not very much going on then. Basically, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> my man, you are you are. Um, I don't wow. miss any soccer games, right? So I, I, I have all my screens. I do not miss soccer games. I do not miss any NFL game. Man, I <laughs> like. I don't mean to just like. I'm just. I don't even know what to say. I just. I'm. I'm wildly impressed by how much you've accomplished and and like the good intent that you've got behind what you're doing. I mean, you seem like a really good dude. The fact that you, like you said, you charge $250 an hour, right? In DFW, but you're, you're offering Upwork services specifically to people because you want to help them grow and you see the, the benefit in business um, and giving people that ability to like removing the object of money from money, making, think of it as more value and the value that you can provide to people. And so you think you can give, you want to make the world a better place, right? Like, so you know that by helping out somebody that, you know, giving value to that's fair to them at the time, will give them an opportunity to, to trickle that value down to other people, man. So I, I appreciate you. I think you're a great dude. I, something just drew me to you. I'm not going to lie. I don't know what it was, but I'm glad that we were able to, to get meeting tonight, man. So I appreciate the introduction. Um, so I guess just kind of outline some of the questions that we have. Um, so one is just going to be LLC versus S corp and leaning more towards LLC. Um, just, me, making sure confirmation that there's not a reason to go S corp route because it seems like we can always transfer later. The second thing would be the state that we set up in. And then the third thing would be how to make sure right from the beginning. I mean, it was your, your main lesson is you want to make sure you're doing it right, right off the bat. You don't want to screw it up so that you're paying for your mistakes down the road. And um, so I want to make sure that our accounting is like perfect right off the bat. So I think uh, those are kind of the outline of our questions and whatever else Michael's got. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you don't mind me asking a question too, we were also considering Stripe Atlas. If you've heard of that before, have you heard of that uh-huh. program? Yeah, Stripe Atlas, the yep. payment platform. Yep, yep. They do, but they set you up as a C corp, so we weren't sure. Right. I mean, there there are quite a few options. So, I'm, I, what do you suggest? Okay, so um, let's start first with the. These are called business organizations, right? So. There is what you call a LLC. What is even an LLC? It's a limited liability company. What does that even mean? It means that in event of default, bankruptcy, any issue, according to the American business law, the Uniform Business Corporation Act, um, the liabilities, the assets of the owners of the company, right? Their personal assets, you cannot reach their personal assets, right? So that's what's called a limited liability company. So they're simply telling you in the in the you know in the US corporations are people they can sue and be sued, they can enter into contracts and so on and so forth. So what a limited liability company does is it removes that extra shield and gives you that protection as a sole proprietor to say, okay, well, you have a limited liability corporation, a limited liability company, which is an LLC. Now that is a federal um, business organization. Most states also um, in the, uh, incorporate that, that form of business, right? So you have a situation where, you know, you open an LLC. What is the difference? I mean, from that, you can start understanding the difference between a sole proprietor and an LLC. A sole proprietor is a one-man business. It's literally an extension of yourself. You're just doing your stuff. You, you know, you don't have those 
tax advantages that you would otherwise have if you're an LLC. Now, when you have an LLC, and what, this is where it gets much more technical, you can have what you call a one-member LLC, or you can have a two-member LLC. Now, when you get a one-member LLC, it is considered by the Internal Revenue Service a disregarded entity. What does that even mean? It doesn't mean you're not legally in business. They're just thinking you're still a sole proprietor. Just and this doing is it under your social, you don't have like right, a... Just to get it under your social. And this is the mistake I always tell small businesses not to do. If the sole purpose of opening up an LLC is to distinguish your business from yourself in practice, especially when you go out there and get rent, you're getting rent in your LLC name, you're getting a bank account in your LLC name, you're getting a business line of credit in your LLC name. It becomes counterintuitive if when you're filing your tax returns, instead of having a separate LLC tax returns, most people go and have that tax return on your Schedule C, right? That is not the best thing to do because you're not separating your business from yourself. Even and then though you're making yourself liable, right? You speak right. Quite- Yeah, that's where you want to totally separate your personal assets and your business assets completely. So, And someone is going to argue with you and say, oh, no, but Schedule C on the 1040 tax return says business income or loss. Okay, you would think the IRS would make that form smarter. Well, they don't. It's the government. What are you going to do about it, right? Because you're going to see down the road as we keep talking, you're going to see that the business owner would decide to have his business separate in practice, in operation, in filing, is going to be subjected under a set of different set of rules from the business owner who has the LLC, but still on their 1040. I wish we had a 1040 form, but that's something we can discuss later, right? So in a, sure, in a, yes. in, in a sense, in, in, essentially what I'm saying is, If you're a business owner, you always have to have two separate tax returns, one for your personal and one for your LLC. Long story short. Okay. That's what you get in a limited liability company. Now, there is no such thing as an S corp. You have what you call a corporation, which is a C corp, which is there. They're the Exxon Mobiles and everything. But most people do not like the C corp. I don't encourage most small businesses to start as a C corp because of the issue of double taxation, right? And also because of the issue of the corporate formalities. For example, to have a C corp, you have to add, you have to um, adhere to some of the corporate uh, formalities of a C corp which means you have to have your board meetings. You have to like uh, issue notices to the members like when you're supposed to have your meetings. You really have to have everything that documents and shows that you're a C-Corp, right? Sometimes for a small business, right? The small business owner is the lawyer, he's the accountant, he's the owner. He cannot do all of that. So that is usually reserved for very big companies or small businesses that start as LLCs, partnerships, or s corp and then eventually become C-Corp. From an, from an operational perspective, you don't want to start your business as a C-Corp because of those requirements that you have to meet. And in, the most, in most cases, people will tell you, oh, just have a C-Corp, you don't even have to do anything. No one is going to come after you to have your board minutes, right? Usually, right. the problems of the C-Corp comes, occur as a result of two partners arguing, the two shareholders arguing about who does what. And then the issues now arise. They would say, okay, when did you call the board meeting? Did you know you had to send notice 30 days before trying to sell his shares, before trying to agree to a business, before trying to agree to a merger plan? That's when those problems start, right? And then you get into issues where they call it piercing the corporate veil, which means you're using the S Corp for other purposes other than for which it was intended, right? So most people don't want to start using an S-Corp with a C a C corp based on the fact that it is difficult to maintain or adhere to some of the compliance requirements that you need as a C Corp. The second and there's really a- no need for it when you're at such an okay. early stage when there's only two people. And 
there's not any tax advantage to doing so in the beginning. Is that right? That is that is correct. There is that's the second point. So I wanted to make sure I highlight the operational aspect because that's what you deal with day to day. The second thing is the tax disadvantage. So an a C corp gets taxed twice. How? Think about the profit and loss that the business makes. Let's say they're selling shoes or they're selling iPhones, right? That profit is taxed at the corporate rate, which stands somewhere around 20, 25% today, I do not know, right? And then the owners of that company, they are shareholders of the C Corp, right? So they get some kind of dividends, right? Those dividends are now taxed. No one wants to do double taxation for a C Corp. That is one of the major disadvantages of a C Corp. So Apple, for example, today, whatever profit or loss Apple makes, 20 or 25% of that goes to the IRS. And then when the owners of the Apple stock receive their dividend checks, they pay a tax on their dividends as well. So that is one of the major disadvantages of a C Corp. Well, the major advantage of a C Corp, of course, is the kind of things they can do. Most of them are multinationals. They have a lot of um, they have a lot of capital and all that stuff. They have the ability to raise a lot of capital and do all that fancy stuff as well. S Corps can do that. So that is why I always encourage small businesses. No small business, to me, honestly, less than a hundred million dollars in gross sales, you don't have any business having a, a corp. Right. Um, now, but we have instances where. Um, you know, we're in America and then, you know, to set up a business in America, you have to be a resident or all that stuff. So some people are forced to start as C Corps because they're not residents. Think about two Canadians trying to start a business in the U.S. remotely or whatever it is. So, you know, sometimes, you know, they, they ultimately will have to be a, a C Corp because like we'll see in the case of an S Corp, which is one of the best things that the American the U.S. tax code has ever that has ever occurred. It's a it's called a subchapter corporation, which means a small corporation. What is it in a sense? It's a pass through entity. This is now an S corp. It's a pass through entity. Well, what the heck does pass through mean? It means whatever profit or loss that the corporation makes flows through the personal tax returns of the owners. Whatever profit and that doesn't loss, happen in an LLC, does it? Or it does depends. with your Schedule C? It, it depends. And okay. We'll get on that. It depends on how many members are in the LLC, and we, that will be our last um, our last thing. Gotcha. So with an S corp, so you have the C corp, which we don't want. Now you have the S corp. Now the S corp, it has all the advantages of a corporation. Well, one major advantage of the S corp, why? I like most small businesses to start with an S Corp is because whatever profit or loss they make, they don't pay tax on the S on the corporation level because it's a pastoral entity. That's what the law says. So if they had gross sales of a million dollars, they had cost of goods sold for nine hundred thousand dollars, the net profit is a hundred thousand dollars. At the C Corp level, they would have paid twenty percent of a hundred thousand dollars, right? At the S Corp, they pay zero. Zero. So now if two people own the S Corp, 50-50, they each get $50,000 and they are taxed at their individual level at $50,000 each. Think again, let's go back to our C Corp example. They made a profit of $100,000. So 20% 20, goes to the IRS, right? Yeah, 80 so the 80,000 so 80, goes to the two of them in the form of dividends and they still get taxed on that. See the issue of double taxation? You see why you want an S Corp. That is the advantage of an S Corp. The second advantage that you get in an S Corp is you can also be an employee of an S Corp. Now, think about it. If you're an employee for an S Corp, then you get salary and wages. Well, salary and wages are deductions to reduce your taxable profit. On the business itself, yeah. On the business itself. Even if you are a one-member S Corp, okay? One member S Corp. S Corp. Yeah. Even if you're just even if it's just one person who owns the S Corp. Because keep this at the back of your head, because down the road I'm going to tell you why it is better when you have an LLC, you elect to be taxed as an S Corp. Just keep this in the back of your head. So even if you're a one member S Corp, 
the profit or loss that the business makes, it doesn't pay any tax at that level. It flows to your personal tax returns on your 1040. Okay, mm -hmm. And the S-Corp does not have all the stringent requirements, operating requirements that we saw with the C-Corp, right? Which means, you know, you're, you're supposed to conduct the business the way you conduct business, you know, have your minutes and your meetings, but their requirements are not as sturdy as the requirements of C-Corp, right? Now, but the only problem with the S Corp, which is not a problem that we worry about, is they can only have one class of share. Now, if you guys are familiar with the equity markets, you will see that Berkshire Hathaway has class, Berkshire Class A, Berkshire Class B, Google Class A, Google Class C, whatever it is. You cannot have that in an S Corp. So you can only have one class of shares. The second thing, restriction with an S-Corp is you cannot have more than 100 shareholders, okay? So it's two of you, 99 of you. As long as you're married, maybe in community property states, you consider more. So if you're not going to have more than 100 shareholders, then you can be an S-Corp. So now you start seeing why some companies are not even eligible to become an S-Corp because they will have more than 2,000 people and so on and so forth, right? Okay, and then another thing is um, an S corp must be owned by you know individuals, right? So you can't have trusts and other kinds of business. Oh, sure. Owning that, right? No entities can so, own it. Yeah, own that. So that is a major advantage of the S corp. So, but how do you become an S corp? You can either start as an LLC and then you elect to be taxed as an S corp, right? Now, when we go back to the LLC, that's where we started right now. We're going back to the LLC. It has all the protections that you get in an S-Corp. But this is what is funny about an LLC. With an LLC, remember, you're all of these companies that we've seen, right? Be it a C-Corp, an S-Corp, the liabilities, the, um, the liabilities of the, the assets of the owners are protected, right? They, they can't pierce into the personal assets, so they, they get that protection. Now, the thing with the LLC is that if you have a one-member LLC, it's kind of like regarded as a disregarded entity. And in most cases, if you're not careful to tell your accountant to do your accounting well, one half of self-employment taxes, because you're not an employee, right? One half of self-employment taxes, you're throwing it out the window, which means you're not getting that. Your health insurance that you pay, one half of it, it's out the window. You don't get that advantage. In fact, as a one-member LLC, if you're filing a Schedule C, you don't even get to deduct the amount of money that you pay yourself for salary and wages because for the most part, it's regarded as a one-man entity. It's just considered a draw. Okay? Mm -hmm. Most people prefer to get an LLC and then immediately, right, elect to be taxed as an escort, right? So that they have so those that, advantages. To have those advantages, right? Other than that, there is really no... Um, that's that's a situation if it's a one-person LLC. The one-person that... LLC. Now, have a two-person LLC, it is regarded as a partnership. Okay? And then you have all sorts of partnership. The same way we have a limited liability company, that's how we have a limited liability partnership, Right? professional corporations and so on and so forth. Well, what is the difference? A partnership also is a pass-through entity, but they're just partners that come together to do a, job, a business together. And whenever they want, they can dissolve, decide to dissolve the partnership, right? But with the LLC, even if one member decides to say, I don't want to be part of the LLC, the other member can continue. But a partnership, remember, it's a partnership. It is dissolved. If there is two people and one person says he doesn't want to be in the partnership, then the partnership is dissolved. It doesn't mean the business cannot continue. It can, but just not as a partnership. Does that make sense? It's oh, also a going from, By going from two to one. Right. Okay, but if let's say if you had three, for instance, and you just dropped Perfect. one person, you're still within a partnership. Yes. Okay, I'm following it. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. Yes, and then, you know, you can go under the Uniform Partnership Act and try to see, like, Will the, the uh, with the expulsion of one member dissolve the partnership? You guys can agree to that, right? Remember, a partnership is a contract. That's why they call it a partnership, right? You guys can say, hey, if one person leaves, this partnership is dissolved. Or you guys can say, hey, if one person leaves, the partnership continues. 
just diverse of its interests and all that. But it's also a pass-through entity. Now, they get what you call a 1065, and then whatever profit or loss the partner makes, they don't pay any taxes. They don't get a salary, though, because they are partners, right? It's called an owner's draw. They have a partnership account, just like just like a bank account. Whatever they put in there, they can get it out, and so on and so forth, right? So, so we can't... I'm sorry to interrupt. Just want to confirm: you can't have salaries within a, within an LLC. You you can have salaries within an LLC only if you elect to tax as an S corp. As, as S corp, yes. That way you can put it under W two wages. I think on line three or line four. I can't remember all the tax returns. Right. It is generally frowned upon if you get a salary as a disregarded one member LLC because it's just like a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietor doesn't get a salary because he's just the it owner. It makes more sense to pass through. Why? For what reason would you do that other than trying to take advantage of tax loopholes as a Trust sole me, proprietor? I have, I have seen all. I, and sometimes those are the people who end up paying me $25,000 a year because I hold my head like this because they just that we now have to go back four years or three years and undo that. So now I have to tell the IRS, no. Even though this guy is a one-member company, um, he meant to run it as an S-Corp. So I do a retroactive S-Corp election. But that is after they've already been audited. And then the IRS comes back and says, Felix, you're taking money out of my pocket, you know, because they've already given him a bill. Now I have to go back and amend those taxes, right? And that is the classic 98% of my clients. Uh, such because they have, wow. you know, they just, because and then no the wonder is, you're trying to work with startups now, man. You don't want to <laughs> deal with that. T- it's like pulling a, like a handful of headphones out of your pocket. It's just a mess. Right. Um, it has its advantages and disadvantages, right? So because I've done it over and over, I kind of know like, you know, um, some of the rules, if not all of the IRS rules. So it's easy as long as it's not past five years, you know, so Anything April 15, 20, what year is this? This is 2019 tax year, even though we're in 2020. So everything 2014 is fair game. I can go back. But if you screwed up in 2010, I can't help you with that one, right? Because How far back can they audit you? I believe it's five. No, the IRS can audit you like they, it depends. If it's fraud, it never ends, right? If it's just random, I think it's five years. It depends on individual. I can't remember. At three five years so on, to be on the safe side always think that the IRS is always right right so they can come back after seven years said they discovered it but they sent you a mail but you didn't get it and all that stuff but you can you cannot go back so that's why i always try and insist and to work with small businesses from the start and say okay well i can't stress this enough this is the reason why you have to have it right from the first from the let go so that's essentially the difference so for a small business out there if we spend 30 minutes one hour two hours what is the lesson to drive home? A small business wants to elect as an S corp, um, a status of LLC, then and then you have ninety days in today's swing fiscal year. For example, what am I saying? To become an S corp, if you start your business in January as an LLC, you want to make sure by March 15, 2020, you file in your application to become an S corp, and it's instant. It's just a two page form, right? Just telling us who the owners. You get that done. Now, I've had instances where I've worked with some other law firms. I've had to, like, do it retroactively and say, hey, they were an S-Corp since 2010. The IRS doesn't like that. It takes too long to approve. You have to go back and do your books according to the S-Corp. Remember, when we're doing it as a sole proprietor, putting all on one tax return, now you have to take all of that data and put it on. And the S-Corp will get what on the business. And then you're... you're redoing the business taxes and the individual taxes it's a mess now you understand dude. why i'm going to charge you twenty five thousand dollars a year just for yeah. yeah just for the retainer because then you have some compliance issues and all that stuff well do people listen some who are those who don't listen the others so do i get paid mm-hmm. so okay cool so that is really, that's why uh, you meet with a professional before you start your business you do I not want heard. it's way cheaper this is way cheaper way, way cheaper 100%. and then get all your business agreements set up you know most people like the one described the, i don't know how, how much do they charge who's that uh strike um, 500 yeah. bucks 
But uh, yeah. it looks like there's a yeah. bunch of other ones, like um, I think it's like Zen Business and some other ones. Yeah, 150, 300 bucks is what it's going now. Yeah, it depends on the state too. For example, in that's Texas, the next question. Like, yes, not a line of it depends on the here. state. Some states are free. Wyoming. Some people do Delaware because it's very friendly with the business laws. So Delaware is. A, you hear everyone says my company is registered in Delaware. That's because Delaware courts have a history of favoring businesses. Okay. So if you're going to sue AT&T in Delaware, good luck. If you're going to sue, but Oklahoma on the flip side, if you're going to sue AT&T, you're a very lucky man, right? It's all about the business laws that are out there in Delaware. They favor businesses. So that's what you hear. Texas is doing it. So not even looking at it from a tax perspective, but you're saying from just kind of a broad legal protection of the business view delaware is more favorable to business laws that would allow us to be protected if we're incorporated in that state absolutely yes so delaware is number one you got texas and you got wyoming right and it depends on what you want to do sometimes you don't need the legal protection you have to think about what you're doing right so let's say someone who comes up with maybe the corona vaccine what do you think they want to incorporate in Delaware, right? Because of the level of risk and everything, the kind of lawsuits that they will get. But a small cleaning company in Texas, right? What is the worst thing that can happen? It will be a negligence lawsuit, which is a tort action, which is a state thing, right? But if you think about coronavirus and the the vaccine for it and all that, then you're dealing with people's uh, right to health, which is federal law which you want the protections of. Uh, that makes so much Delaware. sense. Makes sense. So that's why you hear a lot of people would say, oh, I want to register my business in Delaware, right? But the local repair facility in Texas, you know, you really don't have, you have to assess your business needs, the exposure, the kind of risk that you have in your business. And that's one of the things that most people get with me before registering your business, right? So if you say you want to open, Okay, well, most of your lawsuits would really be negligence lawsuits, people getting injured, right? Those would be negligence action, tort actions at state level. Texas tort laws on personal injury are big. I would recommend you register your company in Texas, but you're going to come up with a patent for your phone or you got you have to do like international money transfers and all that stuff. That is the jurisdiction of, you know, when it comes to patent law, that's the jurisdiction, that's federal jurisdiction. Generally recommended that you be in, you know, in Delaware, schools, Delaware, and so on and so forth. So that's what you get. Now the filing fees, I don't know what they give you, but um, another thing that I have seen, and it's I don't usually recommend it for small businesses, but I also do. I always make sure I tell them they get a certificate of filing that shows the business is registered. They get what you call articles of incorporation or the bylaws of the corporation, what are those? They're just operating agreements on how you're supposed to conduct business, right? Most of these platforms, they just give you a one size fits all. What does that even mean? They will just give you, uh, it's just like something you get from legal zoom, right? You can download it and then, but again, like I said, when does, when does those things become an issue when you guys are fighting? Because you go in there and there is a clause there that states in case of any disputes, there can be no trial. You guys have to settle it or have an arbitration. Yeah. But you didn't read that. You didn't know. It doesn't even work for you. You guys really wanted to go to trial. So, so I got I, kicked out of my first business, Felix. Right. So that's why you <laughs> want to make sure that the owners of the business meet a lawyer to draft their operating agreement. So the way I do it is rather than downloading it, because I can tell you now, I have 50 operating agreements. I can give you, you will really do like, yes, this works perfectly for us. So don't charge us the $250 an hour, you know, that you do to come up with the agreement. Fine. As long as you guys don't have any issues, right? You read it. But then there might be something in there that you didn't know. For example, in Texas, right? Your wife owns, your spouse owns uh, half of what you have, whether you like it or not, whether you told her you were going to do that business or not, right? So you go there, you form a company, and you're doing anything blood and sweat. She's somewhere in Ireland. She doesn't even know anything. And then one day, boom, they tell you um, she got 50% of the business between you and your friend. And you're like, how is that? Oh, they didn't include the spousal form on Schedule B on the thing, right? 
because most of this, when they do it, they don't really. So yeah. what I'm saying is cookie cut agreements are good to the extent that there is no discrepancy, but you really want to, it's just like how you, the two of you have said. You Wait, wanna, I want to, I want to touch back on that Texas scenario you just gave. So uh, spousal agreement, it's split at 50, 50. So let's say Bezos is in Texas and um, like, I guess Bezos is a bad example. That's divorce, getting divorced. That gets messy. Um, just in general, like your partner would own whatever half of it, like would they have that power in the company as well? Or just like a, um, a right to the value of the ownership or would they have You're the right. control? Cause control would be have dictated control. by board. Yeah. They don't have, okay, the control, okay. but they have the right of the value. Right. So, and if you think about it, does it even matter? Well, yes. Yes and no, right? They don't have the control because, of course, the control, your, your name is not on the certificate of formation and all, all that, right? But just like you went out and bought a car in Texas, right? It's Even if it's your name on the, uh, on the title, during divorce, right, it is considered that the car was bought with the community estate, with community funds. They're not going to split the car to two but it's going to be a sale, right? That, that's the kind of idea. So what, what am I saying? I'm saying sometimes you have to know the states where these people are doing business. Denver doesn't have that. Um, California has that. I believe Florida has. It's a community property state. So those, the agreements that I'm drafting for owners who live in community property states have specific clauses that say your wife does not have any control, by you entering into this business venture doesn't necessarily mean she's entitled to the assets and all, you know, all those disclosure forms so that she gets, it's like a prenup, right? Yeah. So you sign a prenup, even if you live in Texas, your wife doesn't have access to the things that you guys had prior to marriage. Because it's But if a, you just go right. to LegalZoom and buy a package yeah. and d the cookie cutter template, you're not going to know that. And then... Yeah. When your when your partner gets divorced and his wife is ordering that his twenty five percent half you know what he owns twenty five percent or whatever is getting ripped away, that's not good. I get and that. I, right, and I'm not one of those people. This is not to downplay legal zoom. So maybe down the road, they're going to improve on it. I I don't know. It's it might be a small business owner out there saying, hey, to hell with this lawyers charge you ridiculous rates. <laughs> We're just gonna make it easy. So it might be just someone also do hustling. So I'm not one of those people who bat out those companies. But I guess some criticisms like this are constructive. So that down the road with AI, they might be able to incorporate those and you know start putting into their contracts. At the end of the day. No one wants, you know, especially a small business that is starting. They don't want to pay thousands of dollars just to set up, right? To the extent that it's cheaper, it's just better for everyone, if you think about it. So hopefully they start incorporating some of those things. That's why at the end of the day, it's always good, first of all, to know what your agreement is, what you would, the vision of the company is set by the owners. That vision is written down. The agreement that you guys come about, how you're going to pay yourself. Now you discuss that with your lawyer, with your accountant, and then you put that in the operating agreement. That's really an operating agreement for you guys. The next two people might not have the same operating agreement, even though they have the same vision. Why? Your vision might change tomorrow. Different needs and too. That, and then that operating agreement would need to be changed and signed. And you want to make sure that it conforms with the law and so on. So those are some of the pitfalls. So if you came to me, for example, to set up a company in Texas, just the filing fees that goes to the state of Texas will be $300. That's not my money. That's but for me to come with your operating agreement for a two-member company, it would take me about three hours. So you're seeing yourself somewhere around $1,000. $1,200, right? And you're like, oh, that's too expensive. Okay. But then you go ahead and set up the company and you don't have the operating agreement or you have whatever is happening. And then, just like one of my business owners out here in Dallas who had their store destroyed and all that stuff, and then you start thinking the disagreements between who had what inventory, what they should do in event this happens, because it's not an act of God. It's different from vandalism. But if you get a standard contract, it's going to have that force majeure clause on there for flawed and an act of God, but this one is vandalism. And even though it's covered by insurance, you know, some of those things you have to kind of like 
put them in the contract and put a clause on there that is going to protect the small business. So, so really, the important thing is to like really dig deep into the future, imagine as many possible scenarios as possible for conflict, for issues, for how long people want to be involved, what the scope is, and and code as many of those things into the agreement as possible um, so that you don't have to fight about it later. That is correct. And I'm not saying that there is always, you can sit today and see the future and know the solution, right? But at least you know where your business is going within the next 12 months. And no one says, first of all, those agreements, you don't have to file them anywhere. They sit in your corporate file. So, but you want to make sure they are updated. That way, you know, if something changes, you talk to your lawyer and say, hey, this is what we're considering to do. Can we include it in our operating agreement? We're trying to admit more members. How, excuse me, how do we do this? Because maybe when we started the two of us, this is how we wanted to run the company. But now that the two of us will be taking another seat, you know, a back seat, maybe these two people, we have to make them do things like this and so on and so forth, setting up all that. That has to do all with the internal control of the company, the functioning, the accounting and everything. And once you really have that set up, you know, running the business is just just becomes easy easier i guess for the entrepreneur you know yeah it's i mean it's a lot of this stuff that we're talking about that holds a lot of people back from ever actually getting into that. entrepreneurship yeah. and that's why i really want to show them like it's not that hard it's not that difficult i mean you did a very good job of really kind of laying up like how it makes sense the, from a sole proprietor standpoint to a one level partnership two level partnership and then s corp c corp and all the way up and it makes sense what the benefits and and downsides are to each of them and i would say that i mean credit to america and, and what uh, we've done to our business system we've really created a lot of like how many countries in the world do you have something like an llc a limited liability company where you can go take money and invest it in something and and screw up and lose it all and not lose your house not lose your like because most company or most countries in the world don't have something like that. Am yeah, I right? that's true. You're, you're, yeah. you're more uh, of an expert in the space. Yeah, yeah. Um, just bear with me one minute. Oh, you're good. Uh, no problem, man. I, again, you've already given us twice as much time as I had uh, as I had asked for, so I really appreciate it. Oh, no, no, no worries. Sorry about that. I was just a... Uh, yes. Oh, no. Um, companies have it. You know, uh, other countries have those, those companies. Now, I do not know how they, they operate. But I know they have it, like in France, they have the private limited liability company. They call it Société Anonyme par Responsabilité Limité. And Germany has it. So if you see most of these companies with a GmbH, oh, yeah. Germany and Switzerland, they have that. That means some limited liability company. Yes. Most, um, you know, business law is universal, right? Um, the UK has it. Um, but some Switzerland is uh, one of the countries where it's hard to open a business, right? You need 20 grand, for example. Yeah, it's just hard. Like I was trying to get my hedge fund there, $20,000 minimum, right? In the US, nothing. You can literally sit here and get a tax ID in two minutes, right? So is it easier to do business in the United States? Yes. Is it easier to register your business in the United States? Yes. In other countries, you know, it's just harder. And that's why you see, you know, we're the number one financial center of the world and it's easier for anyone, you know, really much pretty much to, to, to have a business here. So, yeah. Awesome. I, I appreciate the insight on that, man. Um, let's see. So, I mean, it sounds like obviously the, our, our best bet is to go with an LLC and then to file for an S corp within three months, as soon as we're ready to start paying out salaries. Right. So if you're going to file for an LLC today, you will get approved uh, today. However, um, what's going to happen is since we're already past March, this year is a different year, which means we should have been, uh, we'll be retroactively um, demanding the S Corp status. However, um, because of COVID, even the tax filing deadlines had been pushed, I believe, oh. in July, which means it's a good thing. If you start a business today and you elect to be an S Corp, you would quote unquote not be retroactively asking for it. I think this year they're just gonna grant almost everything because think about any excuse and say it's COVID, they'll grant it. <laughs> you know, we don't so. 
just to make, what do we sacrifice by going from the LLC to the S Corp? Other like the LLC can have unlimited members and the S Corp can only have a hundred. So like, but usually at a hundred, you'd want to scale up to something probably like a C Corp anyways. That's true. And then with an LLC, right? You know, you, if, if you have more than 100 members, if you have more than, so an S Corp is not an organizational status is a tax mechanism. Okay. You still remain an LLC, but you're taxed as an S Corp. Most people, the tax, they ask you what is your business. Tax. Okay. Right. Most people, when you get like the IRS form, if you look at the IRS tax code, I've probably read it a hundred times. <laughs> B, right? If you read the tax code, it would say, are you an LLC? And then how are you taxed? Not all LLCs are taxed as S corps, right? So the S corp is really a federal thing. So there's no state that says you have an S corp. That's why if you use tribe or wherever you use, they'll give you documents that says LLC, and then they will tell you to sign and put your social security number, address. They'll file something to the Internal Revenue Service, telling the Internal Revenue Service this LLC wants to be taxed or it's electing to be taxed as an S Corp. And then you're going to get an official letter from the IRS, which is the federal government, saying you're an S Corp. But in the face of the state, you're really um, you're really a, an LLC. But we- the S Corp status is just simply a, a tax advantage, if that makes sense. Yeah, so we need to do that by July 1st because it, typically we would have missed it. It would have been March, COVID extended. Right. it. And even if it's March, right, If you, they, they would give you the escort, but it's only going to be applicable for the 2021 tax year. 2020, okay. But because we're already in 2020 now, even if we did it, now, even if there was no COVID in my experience and practice, people I've had people start up their business in January 2020 and then elect for S-Corp status in October, and they go back and retroactive Retroactive to March. Yeah, they're generally very friendly with that. I've actually had a business being retroactively applied for four years. They went back four years. It just depends on, you know, the IRS, like the the language. That's the one that was a mess though, right? (laughs) Yes, so that they did it. So, but, you know, but the business owner was, the good thing is if you run it like an S-Corp, they will give you. But if you run it like a piggy bank, they would not give it to you. And, you know, so it just depends. It depends it's not on a piggy time. bank. It's going to be a well-oiled machine providing value for an opportunity for other people. Um, right. So, um, I mean, I, I've got the questions answered, I guess, in terms of what I need to do for, you know, uh, f- for forming the business, what we need to do um, with that. I guess then, do you... I was thinking this was just going to be consultation. I didn't really know where it would go from there. Do you offer accounting <laughs> services? I know. I mean, I don't yeah. have a $25,000 retainer or anything, but. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. No. Yes, I do. So um, my accounting services for small businesses, unfortunately, it might be slightly expensive because I've gotten that feedback, but expensive is subjective. And it's because I just don't do accounting. I do business consultation as well. Um, I do business consultation as well. So my monthly accounting services for your QuickBooks, whatever software you use, we use all types of software. It will be $300 a month. So times 12 months, I guess that's what, 3200 or something like that. And then the personal tax returns is $1,000. The business tax returns is $1,500. It's $600 for small businesses that start. Now, some businesses say, hey, I don't have the money to pay you for monthly accounting services. That's also fine. But then um, you have to project that maybe by the end of the year, you would have the money to pay, right? So I'm not going to charge you the $300 upfront, if that makes any sense, because they're a small business. Hell, where they don't have the money to pay. So it means they're not going to get in business. They're not going to get. So, yeah. but I just don't do QuickBooks and send to you. I tell you what your numbers mean, where they're taking you to, where you do it, like at the end of every month. Man, you're grossing five thousand dollars. What's going on? Can we have more revenue streams? What's the problem? And that's where my coaching and business strategy comes in. I'm like, well, have you looked at this other thing? So that's my hourly two hundred and fifty rate that you get in the three hundred dollars, which is cheap. But then someone will tell you, oh no, come on, do your QuickBooks for hundred dollars. Ninety percent of what I've seen 
they don't they just send you your reports you look at your your profit and loss statement it doesn't match what is in your bank account match means how the business is being run right so um but then you have to be able to know where you're taking your business because at every quarter i'll tell you man if the year was going to end this is how much you've made like what kind of entrepreneur are you at like i have a mechanic shop um bear with me one second that is Like I had a guy who had a mechanic shop and I told him, hey, what you need to do is have, you have a big yard. What you can do is you can start doing auto sales. And then we pushed him. Now he's doing in-house financing. I just helped him apply for his in-house financing. So one of the things with me too is I am grow out other opportunities to monetize the business. If you cannot grow your business, we cannot work together. If you're just one of those dominant entrepreneurs, which I hate to put the word dominant and entrepreneur in the same place. But when I think about what did uh, Amazon kick out of business? Blockbuster. Amazon? You know, yeah, Blockbuster, right? Oh, yeah. Well, no, 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 no. Netflix killed Blockbuster. Netflix, Netflix killed yeah, yeah. Blockbuster. Amazon killed eBay, right? Yeah. So yeah. I hate to put the word dominant and entrepreneur in the same, uh, same sentence because an entrepreneur is usually someone who's active, right? But yeah, like blockbuster I, thinking that people want to come in and pick up things right. physically and like in i mean while netflix was doing the homework so that's that's so i really enjoy working with uh entrepreneurs who are, who are growing and i have to see that growth i, I worked with a trucking company first year in 2016 i worked with them the gross four million dollars 2017 they gross 18 million dollars 2019 they gross 23 million dollars right that is a type of growth that i'm saying and we can only achieve that growth if the numbers make sense to you so i'm not the accountant that you see in february during taxes and as a matter of fact i am hardly in the country between the months of uh february march april i'm always in europe switzerland and stuff like that right yeah but we get your taxes all figured out i don't do late filings Right, I don't do any extensions because those are just red flags. You have twelve years. To you're out. you're you're by the book, man. You're clean. You I, want, and that's why you want to be in every single month, even if it's something right. where you got to work the payment out down. It's not that it's right not a now. monthly payment. Oh yeah, we'll do it quarterly. You want to be on top of it, keep it clean. I I appreciate that. There's no other right. way to do it, man. There's and no I don't way wait till the end of the year and look and say, gosh, I didn't do any business this year. <laughs> well, that year had twelve months, right? The yeah. year had 12 months, so we, you should have known. And then they're like, you know, and then oh, even like some with athletes that I work with, some Dallas math uh, athletes and Cowboys fans, they're like, oh, all the, all the $4 million that I used to make per year is gone. Yeah. And if you don't do an accounting, if you, you know, most people don't even have personal budgets. You know, I just go see my buddy here and use that gas for it. And we all do that, right? But then there comes that time when there has to be accounting. It's done on a monthly basis. In fact, the government likes it so much that public companies have to file quarterly reports yep. and tell the government what's going on so they can see the level of economic activity that's going on and so forth. And so I heard they want to change that. They want to make it, I think, so that they only have to do it every six months. Because, uh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's more of a transparency thing, especially for a right. public traded company. We, we, I think it yeah. should be every single month, honestly. Myself, <laughs> too. Right? We, yeah. So, but that's the kind of like services that you get with me. So, it's not just doing your books, but it's these meetings like this. And this is on, these are unlimited hours, right? Because, you know, in that, you get legal advice. You get accounting advice. I'm like your fractional CFO. I'm really doing your books for you and all that stuff and telling you what they mean in my language, in your language. And then we have strategy meetings, like a part of your marketing and strategy team. Like, okay, well, you want to get into this market. Well, it's in Brazil. It's an emerging market. There's more yields there. What are you thinking? You're supposed to be selling to the older folks in Florida, stuff like that, right? What so you you're, get. you're, yeah, you're, I, I phrase it wrong. You are more than just an accountant. Um, yes. I yes. mean, you, you, would you be able to draw up our partnership agreement given, uh, like we give out a list of what our concerns are? Like, you absolutely. Know, we, absolutely. Awesome. All that's that to finish. And then the, honestly, when we do this, the, most of my clients are the ones who are under audit now. So they, they, they get in, they, they stay with me till their audit is over. 
But what I also do with these small businesses, I try as much as possible to empower them and put them up, up in control of your finances. I, I don't want to hear, oh, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not an accountant either. I wanted to be a lawyer, but my parents said, you have to go to business school. That's why I went to law school after I went to business school. I'm not a good accountant. I don't want to, like, but then I'm forced to be a CPA because that's what I do, right? So if I can do it, anyone else can do it, right? So this is to say that mo because I've seen instances where athletes, most business people say, oh, I don't know accounting. I don't even know. And then the next thing, the accountant stole their money and it's an American grade. They can't find them. That's because the business owner did not know what was going on with the business. No, that, you know, you're with me, you got to know. You got to stay. Felix, your if you're foreshadowing to yourself running away to Switzerland with our money. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, man, I've got it on video right now. That was the plan the whole time. Right, it's going to take up. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, so that's what I encourage business owners to do. Stay on top of your finances. Those numbers should mean something. If anyone comes to you and says, the CPA this, they explain something to you, you do not understand the line. They need to explain it to you so you can understand. In yeah. business. There has to be Money. someone in the business that understands I'm the numbers 100%. About, Right. I'm not talking about legal terms and all those, you know, crypto. I don't understand. I probably never will take things. I don't accounting your money. $10,000 went out. $5,000 came in. It should add up. <laughs> if it doesn't add up, it doesn't make sense. It's probably wrong. Okay. So I encourage every business owner not to go to business school, but just try as much as possible to understand. And that's why when we do it, this is to say that, when we do this over one, two, three years, there comes a point in time, and then everything is automated, QuickBooks is automated. So you wake up in the morning on your dashboard, you know who's owing you, you know what's in your bank account. You could be driving down the street and say, oh, Felix, I have $18,000 in the bank account, but I have another $40,000 coming in. I'm like, do you see an abandoned building there where you think we can make a 7-Eleven? You say, yeah, man, I'm like, go for it. See what I'm saying? Yeah. But if you don't have that report in hand, you cannot grow. You'll be driving with like a blind person down to the office. And then you the other person where you're at. will seize that opportunity. So that's why it's critical for that to happen all the time because we get used to it. And then when you, you, you sleep at night, you think, you look at your cash flow, you look at it, it, you sleep better, you will say. And then after five, six, seven years, you'll be like, Felix, I got this. We don't need your services no more. And that's where my excitement, that's my joy. Because I know I've empowered another business person. I've empowered another successful entrepreneur who knows how to manage their money. And that's what, that's where I derive my happiness. Because I believe that if every small business owner is able to do that, then they're able to provide us the best service without worrying about the accounting. They're able to do the best of themselves as entrepreneurs, if that makes sense. So you want every person to achieve their best self, 100%, man. Michael and I, uh, the only reason I would bring, uh, like I said, I lost my first business getting kicked out um, after we built it up to being about a million dollar business. They kicked me out, got nothing for it. And it yeah. was because I didn't do it right up front. And I also didn't, they were my friends, but they weren't somebody who I had a a real connection or understanding really who he was like me and Michael are both we're we're real people man and it's about our values and what we're trying to do for people and provide opportunities for people so um I mean you definitely you're speaking our language there and um I mean we'll have to talk about everything but I, I definitely want to be working with you in the future man I can't see myself working with anybody else or uh, anybody <laughs> saying cool. anything that would make me want to work with them any more than what what you've been able to say and do with us tonight here so i really appreciate it man uh your generosity of your time giving us some extra time i will i will make that up to you i promise yeah. um oh, you don't have to but if the same one it's fine it's not a big deal i was just not doing anything anyway so but then when you start making that money then you know my 5600 dollars you would pay it and all that yeah because if anyone tells you to do something it's free run away it's not right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but I, uh, you, you don't worry about it it's it's good that's i, I do this I've, I've had like calls like this for like two hours and it's fine because it makes me and that's one of the things that you're I'm, passionate I'm, about it so i mean as long as you can be using right. your time for that even if it's free right. dude yeah. like it's you're having fun doing it in a way yeah 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 so i guys, appreciate uh, that man all right Thanks. And cool. you guys, I think you got my email. I'll send you guys my email. Um, it has my contact information, my firm information. 
anytime, reach out, anything. Sounds good. Um, would you be able to meet again later this week sometime um, to work on a partnership agreement before the weekend sometime? Absolutely. What's a yeah, day that works absolutely. good for you? Um, I'm booked tomorrow. Tomorrow's Tuesday, right? Yep. Wednesday works. Wednesday works? Anytime Wednesday after 10, I get to my office at 10 because I trade the market. Sometimes I'll be up watching the Asian markets in the middle of the night, but 10, anytime between 10, and whatever time it don't matter okay whatever. sounds just good yeah it seems pretty open schedule and, right and i adjust it okay awesome hey felix i appreciate you, brother you are uh you're a real one you're inspiring or, you're authentic um i feel blessed having gotten a chance to meet you and um, get all the positive vibes that you sent this way so and uh i mean honestly again this has been recorded so i hope that this creates some content that inspires other people because i mean really you, you made it sound really easy for anybody um that's how it's supposed to be i appreciate it thank you guys so much and you shared the spirit so uh, yeah. you're you're a real one man i want to give you a hug right now but i uh, can't do that but i will uh, i'll talk to you later and yeah, thank you very much elbow, bro. <laughs> <laughs> take All care right, guys, out there okay thank you so much